Bon la cal, my garden of roses. Let's spend some time talking about the stock market and quantitative easing. Now, if you've been paying any attention today, and you don't really have to because I've got a video feed of it right here right now, showing you exactly how volatile the market is, you may have noticed that Monday the stock market opened and dropped 666 points, followed by opening today a record well, by points, a record 1,175 points. Now, while that is a record by points, it is by no means a record by percentage, as that only accounts for about 4.6% of the stock market's value in total, given the Dow Jones Industrial Average only takes into account the top 30 stocks. But, uh, what we're seeing here is perhaps more normal than anything we've seen in the last 10 years, especially the last, uh, well, yeah, the last nine years, because from 2009 to 2015, we were essentially playing a fool's game. Now, for those who don't know, and I'm going to be using um, a few different references here, quantitative easing, simply put, is an unconventional monetary policy, I'm using the quote from Investopedia, in which central banks purchase government securities or other securities, such as, say, debt assets, um, bonds, uh, these kinds of things, large-scale government securities and market securities, uh, in order to lower interest rates and increase the money supply. Quantitative easing increases the money supply by flooding financial institutions with capital in an effort to promote increased lending and liquidity. Now, that said, there wasn't very much liquidity or lending, for that matter, following the economic crash of 2007 and 2008. In fact, lending was at an all-time low, despite the fact interest rates had plummeted between 0 and 0.25%. Quantitative easing is, is, is considered when short-term interest rates are at or approaching zero and does not involve the printing of new banknotes. That said, it basically has the exact same effect. And by doing so under the Obama administration, we injected about $4 trillion into the market, and the market seemed to stabilize in a way that it rarely has in its lifetime. Uh, the fact of the matter is, the market should be more unstable than it is. However, what we're seeing now is a return to a more natural state for the market, if not completely natural. Now, if you're watching the screen, you can see that the market has ticked up, but it's losing that advantage. And, well, it's bouncing back and forth, back and forth. And I think there's a good reason for this. Now, there have been a lot, there's been a lot of talk and a lot of assumption about what is called the Working Group from 1989, a group assembled by President, then President Reagan to discuss and advise the government on how to manage large plummets following the stock market crash of 1989, the last Black Tuesday we've seen. And it is greatly assumed by investors and just about confirmed that this working group was essentially a, uh, well, a, a team of investors and very wealthy people who could be called on at a moment's notice to rapidly buy up stocks and prevent or mitigate the greater effects of such a large drop. Um, it was... Uh, colloquially called the Plunge Prevention Team. Now, no one knows the exact names of the individuals who worked on this, except for one, a person who worked at the Fed at the time named Heller. And he gave a speech in 1989, which basically revealed the evidence of a uh, working team, uh, of the working team having such, you know, the ability. And, well, I'm concerned about it. I have my concerns, but at the same time, I'm impressed by the, the fact that what we've seen, which would be terrifying to most, has been mitigated by a group of people who are literally buying up stocks to prevent severe damage to our market by such a large plunge. People have been selling off left and right, trying to get in before the great losses surpass the level at which they bought in and still retain a profit. However, 
Donald Trump has been extremely quiet this morning. He hasn't been talking on Twitter. And while people are shouting at him on Twitter for not saying anything, I suspect he's got a little bit more on his plate than to sit there and tweet about the market. Uh, we've just hit negative 61 again, which is not the lowest point we've seen this morning. Uh, so let's, let's talk about uh, Reagan's working team and why I think that that's important. This has been extremely volatile, but it's showing rapid response in which the sell-offs are being responded to rather quickly with rapid buyouts of all of these sell orders, pushing the market back up into a much, you know, having the effect. Uh, yesterday, it halved the effect of the 666 point drop on Friday. And today, we've already seen the effect halved and then dropped again and then halved and then dropped again. Even if we're not getting back up to the 25,000 or 26,000 mark on the Dow Jones, we are seeing its impact greatly inhibited and the, the uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The regression of the curve we're going to see is going to be much shallower than what we thought it might be at the beginning of the day. This is probably terrifying for a lot of people. It's not just the United States that is experiencing such large drops. 2% on the German DOX, uh, the London markets have dropped, the Chinese market is plummeting, and the fact that the United States is able to fare as well as it is through this, weathering out this storm, by the way, we just have surpassed again the, uh, we are back in the positive again, which is extremely wonderful but that's just how volatile it is. This still makes me think that we are facing some very large economic troubles in the future. Now, does that mean these economic troubles can't be handled? I don't think so. I think we're going to be seeing a lot more economic in, uh, involvement. However, it's important to note that what we're seeing here is government involvement one way or another. While having private investors fix the problem as uh, you might describe the working group and the presumed working group that Donald Trump has put together might cause to the point where it might even be considered insider trading to some, which is why the identities of these people would be kept quiet if they exist. This is protecting people's jobs. This is pre protecting people's 401k and retirement plans. And that is extremely important, especially at a time when the uh, labor market is booming, uh, when uh, the GDP is climbing. And the only problem that we see in the market right now, uh, other than, of course, this enormous plummet of the market, is a notable... Uh, well, okay, it's not, it's more than notable. It's pretty extreme. It's the highest our trade deficit has been in, uh, what, nine years? With a trade deficit value of approximately 56.1 billion. But of course, this is also something Trump has talked about his entire campaign. Trump wants to fix the trade deficit problems, and these trade deficit problems are only enunciated by the fact that our largest trading partners, China, Mexico, and Canada, and specifically China, China is known to manipulate the market, to lie in their reports, and to enunciate the problems for other countries by minimizing the impact of their own influence. So if Donald Trump has, in fact, put together a working team, a plunge protection team, uh, to buy up all of these sales and keep the market afloat during stable, a period where we're still trying to build stabilization, I'm at most going to say that he's doing his job, if doing so in a slightly dark way, instead of doing so in a way that completely screws over 90% of the nation for the sake of the top 1% of the nation, which is exactly what quantitative easing did. Yes, under Obama, the market did slowly climb, but it did so through rapid and constant injection of cash into the market by the central bank. This is something that I don't agree with in the slightest because this only centralizes the power further. 
This is why Google was able to grow as massive as it has and operate under a mergers and acquisitions policy, which has essentially turned them into a feudal state. This is why Apple has grown in that way. This is why Amazon has grown in that way. And given that the Dow Jones only represents the top companies, of which five of those are the FANG companies, Facebook, Amazon, Apple, Netflix, and Google, I don't see them losing their money, especially in comparison to the S&P 500, which has stayed a lot more stable. Yes, it lost about 4% over the last three trading days, but at the same time, it is climbing back up very slowly as the S&P 500 should. What we're looking at here is an economic, is, it's economic warfare at its simplest, but market ec economics is warfare to begin with. And if the president has gotten private investors to spend their money to buy up these stocks to shore up the market until trade deficits can be repaired and finances can be uh, fixed, essentially, without the involvement of the central bank, until interest rates can be, can be brought up, which they absolutely need to be, then I, I applaud him for his efforts. Now, if there is a working trading group, they're not the only ones at play here. Ever since 2000, uh, 2009 or so, when the major investors of Scion Group and others who basically, you know, showed the world how to short stock, you know, short the stock market, how to use credit default swaps. There have been a wealth of new investors who have been waiting for a moment like this because they saw the negative impact that quantitative easing would have in the long term. In fact, many people back in 2009, 2010, 2011 were predicting this exact kind of volatility to follow within a couple years of the quantitative easing being uh, finished off. That said, the market is, you know, only just beginning to recover from the enormous injection of cash. And normally, you know, when you basically create cash out of almost nothing by having your central bank purchase out these, uh, these bonds, these government securities, these debt assets, you're going to have a problem you're going to have interest rates skyrocket. However, quantitative easing is doing this as a means to plummet the, <clears throat> to drop the interest rates and create an environment in which investors feel comfortable and uh, banks feel comfortable to make their investments. That didn't happen under Obama. That didn't happen at all. We didn't have a tech boom like was being predicted at the very beginning of the attempts at quantitative easing. In fact, quite the opposite happened. Most of the wealth fell into the hands of a very select few companies, most of which being the Dow Jones Industrial Average. The NASDAQ and, and everyone is down at this moment, but I don't want people to be afraid. In fact, I want people to go back and look at the history of the market under Clinton and Reagan, uh, I want people to go look back at the quality of the market following the economic, the, uh, the Great Depression and throughout World War II, and I want people to think about smaller stocks. I want people to think about diversifying even wider instead of playing the pure blue chip game. Because right now, everything we've seen centralizes on these FANG corporations, centralizes on Tesla Motors more than Toyota, more than GM, more than any of the American car companies. And I don't consider Tesla an American car company. I consider Elon Musk's operations as a corporate or a country unto themselves because he does his best to avoid paying taxes, just like any other major player in the market right now. And I want people to realize that this is not nearly as bad as it seems. This volatility is being addressed, both by private investors and those close, I, undoubtedly close to Donald Trump, who of course was a businessman and plays things close to his chest when he has to. What we're seeing here is 
not the beginning of the end. The beginning of the end will come when there's no one left fighting, f you know, for the American people. But at this point, there are people fighting for the Americans. And while I hate to finish this off by saying that while the market is down 77 points or 0.32%, wait until the end of trading day. You'll see that the curve, once, uh, once it has been regressed to show how the curve matched out, was much smoother. And while we're still accelerating at a downward turn, we're not at the end of fixing our economy yet. We're nowhere close. This, the tax cuts were just the beginning. This working group is working to purchase up stocks and keep companies afloat, essentially. Other investors are seeing these massive sell-offs and purchasing them up as fast as they can to keep these companies afloat. And while I'm not a fan of keeping companies like Google and Amazon afloat, I would like to see them either destroyed by the market or taken apart by antitrust cases. This is unfortunately just another step in repairing the economy. We saw the, we saw the economy reach its highest point at the beginning of this year at 26,000 for the Dow Jones and nearly 3,000 for the S&P 500. It's going to swing down and it's going to swing up. And only if something actually breaks, such as the automotive debt market or the, um, or the uh, credit card market, which are decently posed to collapse at any point, then we will have something to truly fear. But right now, there is no evidence that this is more than fearful people people fearing a, bullet, a bearish market and selling off before things get worse. The end of the day, we're probably still going to be about 20, I'm going to predict 24,500, 24,400 on the Dow Jones and 2650, maybe 2700 on the S&P. That's, that's being optimistic, of course. But it's not the end of the world, it'll only be the end of the day. And again, every time it gets too low, it starts to rally, it starts trying to rally again, as it's trying to do right now. So don't hang yourself or jump out of any skyscraper windows yet. Wait until the end of the week. Wait until the president speaks. Then we'll have more to work on. Bonsoir, mon chers. I'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.